But the only issue, as far as he's concerned, is uh, the inability of the leader to live by personal example to lead his people. And I want to agree with him only in 50% of his thoughts. Again, because there is a chief executive of an international company, uh, Richard Branson, who had had business experience with Nigeria. And he was reported to have said that in his experience with the Virgin uh, Nigeria, that they made a lot of money, but that people within the government circle wanted to share the money. And I couldn't see how a profitable venture can come out of that. He then concluded that Nigerian people are very nice, but that the politicians can kill dream. He said, that is an irony because the people make up the politician. The message here is that as followership of our leaders, we also need to take a selfie. We need to look at ourselves because our leaders have come from us. And unless we purge our followership of some of these characteristics that have not moved our country forward, we will always bring up our kind of leadership. And this is my message that we all have a stake in this country. The problems are not that of our leadership alone. The problem is that of both leadership and followership. And the followership therefore requires a complete social engineering to be able to move our country forward. Thank you very much. That has been my pastime in the last uh, three years. Now, straight to my um, topic. I want to start by talking to us about outbreak. Um, people do describe outbreak as occurrence of uh, more cases of diseases. Uh, sometimes in a given close environment like an institution or maybe a small town or local government. Then epidemic is seen more as an emergency situation of an outbreak, but then it's bigger than just being a small outbreak. Some people don't think there is so much difference between the two. However, those terms may be used interchangeably. A pandemic, however, is a disease outbreak that has spread across countries or continents. And that is what we are experiencing now with the case of COVID-19. So when we talk about issues with disease outbreak, we are talking about an outbreak level, an epidemic level, or even at a pandemic level. What disease outbreak have we experienced in Nigeria? Lassa fever happened in 1969. Ebola came to Nigeria in 2014. Yellow fever has been with us since 1864. And we seem to have been having um, gradual um, 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 serial uh, occurrence uh, over the years, even up to last year, 2020. Only in 2016, we were able to uh, uh, push out poliomyelitis in Nigeria. We had monkeypox as far back as 1970, 78, 2017, and then of course cholera, of course, quite often. Now, our experience in combating this disease outbreak really is what has brought uh, uh, the idea of talking about this topic. For example, in 1996, Nigeria experienced an epidemic of uh, uh, cerebrospinal meningitis claimed about more than 11,000 lives. And because of a, a, a perceived inability of the country to put that outbreak in check, or the weakness inherent in the health system, the Saudi Arabia had decided to ban Nigeria from going to Arch that very year. Now, over the past years, when disease outbreak occurred in, in the West African Council, it's been noticed that under reporting or, uh, or trying to conceal the outbreak uh, without actually telling, uh, uh, telling about it has been an issue. And uh, maybe because some of these will have um, um, a fallout in relation to uh, political or economic reasons. And so countries try to manage that. 
that is not a good way to do it. Because on the long run, most countries around us then come up with uh, revised immigration policies, just like we also have for people from Brazil, from India now, um, they need to be checked. And of course, direct flights from those places to Nigeria are not allowed to come in. So these are the major issues that can follow uh, a disease outbreak that is not well managed. However, in 2007, Nigeria decided to uh, create a national public health institute, which is in charge of uh, disease outbreak and disease control uh, for the whole country. Prior to then, my institution, Nigeria of Medical Research, has been the one uh, serving that function. So in 2011, the NCDC was created with a mandate to lead preparedness, detection, and response to infectious disease outbreak and public health emergencies in Nigeria. Since then, the NCDC has done a lot. They created laboratories in the area of uh, detection of viral hemorrhagic fever, yellow fever, and co. They, in fact, have increased the Nigerian capacity to be able to make diagnosis of some of these disease outbreaks. One of the things they have done is to create opportunity for uh, people to, to learn within two years in a program that has been referred to as uh, uh, Applied Epidemiology and Laboratory Techniques, uh, NFLTP, a two years in service program, an opportunity for us to create a cohort of uh, field epidemiologists uh, scattered all over the country who can rise up to the occasion. I think this is one of the best trends and preparation uh, preparedness that we have. And of course, NCDC also has established an incident coordination center, which uh, necessarily just map out how to strategize against an outbreak, uh, follow up, review reports, and then try to use that to determine uh, next steps. Uh, indeed, NCDC has done very well. The fourth sustainable partnership with, with uh, international partners that have been coming to their aid from time to time, the WHO, the African CDC, the US CDC, the West African Health Organization. So the leadership of the NCDC has um, prepared the, the, the organization uh, for any outbreak. We may need to improve on this because there are a few gaps that I'm going to talk about. Now for COVID-19, it came in December 2019 in Wuhan and the WHO declared it as an outbreak of public health uh, emergency of international concern. And as I said yesterday, we've had more than 177 million confirmed cases and more than 3 million um, uh, deaths. So far, we do not have any effective drug treatment except for vaccination for prevention. All we have are the MPIs. In Nigeria, we got our first case in February. And as I said yesterday, we've had, according to the NCDC, uh, only about 167,000 uh, cases and about 2,000 deaths. Governments then uh, uh, created the PTF, uh, a government um, source that uh, took over the, the public information and plan uh, uh, how to uh, ensure that public health uh, instructions are carried out and they brief Nigerians almost on a daily basis until we have uh, very low uh, cases in Nigeria. I think recently they have become um, um, a, a committee of uh, the federal government. Again, the NCDC has used that opportunity to increase the number of molecular laboratories that we had. At the time when the, when the outbreak started, we had only about five molecular laboratories. Now we can boast of more than 110 or 20 molecular laboratories scattered all over Nigeria. This again is um, a very good thing to happen to Nigeria. Perhaps that is a dividend of uh, COVID-19. We, we have in fact since then gone through two waves in Nigeria. Some have gone through three waves. And you can see from this map, I mean, from this graph, the one in red is actually positive cases and the one in black is the number of tests. And our first wave ended somewhere at about September 
and dragged on to early part of November. And then we had the second wave. Now, be between September and early part of October, we, have, we had the two important things that have happened. Government uh, re re removed the lockdown, so people were able to go out, were able to mix together. Uh, parties were coming up, religious houses were uh, functioning. And then we had this NSAS. And these, perhaps, were what appears to have uh, created uh, the spontaneous rise in case, uh, cases, and then we developed another uh, second wave in November. With this um, uh, uh, data coming from the Nigerians of America, it's a drive and walk through center in Lagos. We were able to, pre to predict the second wave exactly in November 13, uh, during, uh, in one of my Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle, where addressing there has been a recent increase in the number of positive cases of COVID-19 at our testing center and laboratory because we were able to monitor it. This is part of surveillance. Nigerians need to prepare for the second wave. That was um, the tweet. And then thereafter, the second wave uh, started. The second wave seems to have gone down now. And um, we hope that we will not have the third wave, uh, provided that we can keep in check uh, most of these activities and the COVID-19 protocols. Now, issues in case management and clinical research has been shown that uh, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, clinical research has been shown to improve outcome of case management in terms of supporting treatment or supporting diagnostic, during disease outbreak, clinical research has always been left behind. If we had been able to match the two together, then we would have been able to create our own vaccines as the disease started. We probably would have been able to create our own drugs, but we paid significant attention to case fertility, case management, and the clinical research so far. So there is really indeed a need to consult multiple stakeholders. NCDC often uh, does what they call simulation, preparing for an outbreak and trying to simulate an outbreak. Oftentimes, clinical research is also left behind, whereas, uh, we need simulation and clinical research to plan and deliver uh, some form of um, um, outbreak uh, research plans that we can also simulate. And we can start talking about how do we, for example, uh, develop vaccine for a future outbreak? How do we, for example, um, repurpose drug agent? What will happen uh, to our regulatory agencies? What are their roles? How do they fast track things so that in an outbreak, we work hand in hand to be able to produce results and support public health responses. The NCDC formed what they call the Nigeria COVID-19 Research Consortium, which I happen to chair with the co-chair with the NCDC DG. But the major issue was that there were no funding. Up till now, uh, we put out a call for people to validate diagnostic kits at the time when the disease was ravaging. But we have not been able to award that because we had to be looking for fund all over the place. You can imagine the, the, the power of case detection in disease uh, 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 management and surveillance. Now, one of the things that we were able to do at Nigeria and South America during the first wave and part of the second wave was to adapt this uh, um, CPAP and oxygen helmet because we realized that there were not enough uh, ventilators in Nigeria. And this is a non-invasive method of providing oxygen for people with COVID-19. These were tested in a trial in eight teaching hospitals, and it was found to be very effective, and the outcome for people have been very good. This is one way where you need to align case management and clinical research together so that both can come up with newer modality of treatment for people that will improve the outcome of disease. This study was supported by the CDC Foundation from the US and the Aliko Dangote Foundation 
in Nigeria. Again, we need to be able to uh, go through clinical trials because this is the standard for us to be able to determine which drug will be very useful for us in an outbreak. How do we determine um, what doses will be useful to treat the patients with those diseases? Phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four clinical trials are things that we can do. We do have people who are knowledgeable about it. But if we do not have plans to fund clinical research, along with an outbreak, we may not be able to develop our own drugs. So we end up doing more of phase three trial, which is basically an efficacy assessment and effectiveness study, and of course, safety. So we need to ensure that these things are put in place. And for us to be able to do that, you need to be able to put up a protocol showing study design, exclusion criteria, assessment of efficacy, and safety. And then, of course, you require population. Nigeria has a huge population where we can do multiple center trial rather than people looking for several countries to do the drugs. We have a large number of teaching hospital tertiary center where you can recruit patients, and we have skilled healthcare practitioners. More importantly, we have um, organized regulatory system, NAVDAC. Uh, National Research Ethics Committee, National Health Research Committee. And of late, we have uh, funders like Tech Fund, the National Research Foundation, and the Central Bank of Nigeria. Now, all these people must come together with the NCDC to look at how we can prepare for an outbreak coming in future, how the funders can provide funding, what they need to provide funding for, and the regulatory agents should start talking about how to fast track uh, a regulatory and um, approval for research to be done, especially when we talk about clinical trial, either on drugs or, or, or diagnostic uh, device. So I move on to issue of clinical research and vaccine development. Today, uh, almost uh, all the, the developing countries have uh, vaccines being produced in their country. And if you look at Africa, there are only five uh, countries. Even these five countries, none of them is currently producing COVID-19 vaccine. It is just being planned. And Nigeria is not even there. And we used to produce vaccines in the past. So we need to be able to look at how we can align together the case management, the clinical research, and then of course, drug development, especially in terms of vaccine. What do we need? In the next um, few more years, by 2050, it's been projected that Africa will require 25% of vaccines being produced. And yet, we cannot produce any vaccines now. This is a wake-up call that we must put funding in vaccine development specifically. What do we need? Do we have the capacity to be able to develop vaccines? You require the academia. We have plenty of universities in Nigeria and professors, many of them scientists, who really have trained both locally and uh, abroad, but there are no opportunities, the, 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 the uh, research uh, environment that they need to engage in to be able to come up with these ideas. We need partnership, and of course, we need the industry. There are practically no industries in Nigeria that can produce vaccine now. We used to have a bio, bio vaccine, which government is trying to uh, bring back again, uh, working with uh, May and Baker. So this area has to be settled. Then come to the scientists, the vaccine innovators themselves. What are the methods? The DNA, the RNA, we have learned a lot about these methods of vaccine production. The potency of units and then the viral-like particles. What we used to have before, the live attenuated and inactivated virus. Uh, but now we have faster way, especially using the RNA and, and DNA, which can uh, ask yourself to produce the likes of the virus that your body can produce antibodies to. These are methods that are known all over the world. And we have people in this country who can actually come up with uh, some kind of candidate vaccine. 
for us. A vaccine for COVID-19 is expected to uh, make people acquire immunity against the disease. And it was very easy for researchers to do this because before there are body of knowledge about SARS and MERS, which are coronaviruses uh, of similar architecture. So this, um, uh, the sequencing for these ones and vaccines for them have been made in the past. So when SARS-CoV-2 came, it was easy. And as soon as the genetic sequence was, uh, data was shared, it was easy for scientists to move on. So far, um, many of these vaccines have been shown uh, to be efficacious, as high as about 95% in phase three clinical trial. And as of April, we have about 16 vaccines that have been authorized by some regulatory agency of some country for public use. Again, this is one area where Nigeria has to do better. We must learn to use what we do in our own country. We must encourage researchers and innovators so that when these people come up with their patents, with their, with their innovations, they need both political support, they need funding support, and we must be able to put them to use in our country. Many of the vaccines produced, the two RNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna, were being used in the US even before the WHO says so, once you are sure of what you have. And many of them, many countries were already booking and paying ahead so that as soon as they are ready, they can buy them. We had so far five viral vector vac uh, vaccines, like the Russian vaccine and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which we have in Nigeria. And then of course the Johnson and Johnson vaccines. So far, we have about 308 vaccine candidates in various stages of development. What has been our own contribution to vaccine development in Nigeria? I am aware that uh, the Redeem University Nede probably have a, has a candidate vaccine which is ready for phase one trial, uh, clinical trial. Um, I don't know how far that has been gone, but in the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research, we had two approaches. The first one was the protein subunit, SARS-CoV-2 protein subunit approach, and the other one is uh, SARS-CoV-2 inactivated vaccine. And I can tell you that we have been able to, seek, uh, to, to, to design and produce our own peptides, and that peptides had been cloned uh, in the plasmids and um, have been purified for us to inject them in our animals. That is the stage where we are. Uh, currently, we have harvested the, the antibodies and we are trying to see if these antibodies have neutralizing power against uh, the virus. The second one, which is an inactivated vaccine, we are now currently, we have grown the virus and we are currently trying to inactivate the virus for us to be able to inject in an animal. And uh, this picture just show uh, the first day when we tried to inject the rabbit uh, on, on a small candidate vaccine that we are trying to study. Hopefully, if we are lucky, we'll get something out of this. Otherwise, we go back and then start all over again. We need this um, uh, expertise and capacity for our future disease outbreak. And there are many scientists in Nigeria across the country who can engage in this kind of study. And we, all we need is to align this with the public, uh, 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 public health response uh, via the NCDC and then the Nigerian government and through the Federal Ministry of Health so that these things can go on pari passu and we will be able to come up with our own local vaccines at any point in time when we have an outbreak. Opportunities for vaccine manufacturing, we could be producing the antigen just like I've said, or we might start with uh, receiving formulation and filling or just packaging. We can start from somewhere. At least what will happen is that we will have a base, a base for vaccine in Nigeria and we will not have to be waiting for, for other countries to come and produce vaccines for us. We have only had less than 4 million doses. And we, we are hoping that by August, maybe we'll get another dose. But if we have a vaccine production company, maybe through technology transfer, we would have been able to do this. This is what we are trying to say by 
are asking that we must align a public health response, case management with clinical research so that we can be able to produce our own local. The, the uh, issues that we have, challenges that we have faced, lack of belief in local researchers and scientists' capability. Like I said, we must learn to believe in ourselves and we must learn to fund our scientists and we must learn to use whatever we produce. Poor funding for vaccine research. There are no specific funding for vaccine research until recently when the CBN came up with the idea and the highest we had was 50 million. That will do nothing, even for preclinical testing. So uh, while we are thanking the CBN for what they have done, we want them to increase the fund and to allow researchers to be able to start from scratch rather than waiting for um, uh, what they call translational research, uh, where these vaccines might have been developed. It takes a lot of time, energy, and money to get to that stage. Of course, lack of synergy between academia, industry, government, and agencies. This is the alignment that we are talking about, that we must put all hands on deck and have a team around the country so that when we have an outbreak, this team can come up and then uh, help the NCDC in, in public health response. The regulatory agency block, in terms of IRB for research, there have been issues and experience in this corona pandemic. I will mention them very soon. And then, of course, uh, we depended much more on foreign financing. I think that has to change. Issues in surveillance and clinical research. We must thank federal government uh, for giving uh, uh, our institute and many other government agencies what they call COVID-19 um, intervention. We were able to, uh, to purchase a next generation sequencer, which is very germane to public health response when we talk about the drug development, diagnostic development, vaccine development, even tracking strains of viruses and determining whether the strains that we have are strains that are more virulent or they are just ineffective strain or they are what they call variants of uh, concern. This is what we need to have, a very robust system. I believe we, we do not have many centers in Nigeria that are able to, uh, to, to acquire next generation sequencer. This is something that government should pay attention to. And the NCDC as a disease control uh, uh, body in Nigeria also needs to work with these centers so that we can help NCDC with their genomic surveillance. So we can track strains of uh, coronaviruses and any other emerging virus outbreak that we have so that we will be able to provide the appropriate public health response to it. This was the first case of um, coronavirus in Nigeria. This is a phylogenetic tree of uh, that case, which was sequenced in Nigeria of medical research. And tracing the, tree, the phylogenetic tree uh, showed that indeed uh, there had been coronavirus in bats reported uh, in Zaria and have been found also in camel at some point, but these are not SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, so and you can see where we have the SARS-CoV-2 on the, uh, the phylogenetic tree. This is the beauty of having a next generation sequencer because you can actually map where these viruses are coming from. And then of course, determine the strains and whether the strains are important or not. So in ensuring that we assist the NCDC, we work with the NCDC, the US CDC, and the University College London to determine the burden of coronavirus infection in Nigeria. When people talk about inadequate tests and that the figures that are coming from the NCDC are not uh, uh, the real figures that we have. So we decided to go into the community to see how many people have come in contact with the virus. And we studied four states, Enugu, Gombe, Lagos, and Nasarawa, um, a joint um, um, action plan with the NCDC and with the USCDC and the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research. And um, 
It wasn't a surprise because we already had a, a community infection. It was just that we really didn't know how much uh, more it was compared to the figures that was coming from the uh, NCDC. And we found out that um, we had as high as 23% in Enugu and Lagos who have come in contact with the virus and have developed antibodies against the virus. Because the test we use measured the presence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in those individuals. So this tells us that if we take Lagos, for example, of about 20 million people and 20%, 23% of them have come in contact and have developed uh, antibodies, that's much more than 5 million. And yet, from our active cases, we have seen only 166 or 167,000 cases. This tells you that a lot of people in Nigeria have come in contact with the coronavirus. And this was at the end of the uh, first wave. So you can imagine when the second wave came, how many more people would have come in contact. Perhaps we have close to double this who are now carrying the antibodies around um, before vaccination. And then, of course, the little bit of difference between uh, the cities and the rural area, which is uh, expected. Again, in our attempt to ensure that we work hand in hand to be able to help in surveillance and, and, and case management, our institute haven't um, um, sequenced the first case and sequenced many more cases. Since using the Nigerian strain, we are able to develop two test kits. This first one is called what we call SEMA, uh, which is uh, SARS-CoV-2 molecular, uh, isotherma molecular assay test kit. It's a point of care test kit, was adapted to a T16, uh, T16 machine, and it can provide results in 40 minutes. This is the kind of support that you need for a disease surveillance because this can be carried about. It can be used at the airport. It could be used at uh, the teaching hospitals as their, as their side lab. Even the smaller secondary hospital uh, will be able to use this because it requires only a minimal level of uh, training for just uh, laboratory scientists. The second one was Kodak, which is called SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, molecular assay. And this uh, can provide results within 57 minutes using the uh, PCR that all the molecular labs uh, currently have. These are products to support both case detection and of course, clinical surveillance. If we are able to put some of these things to use, they have been developed and produced locally. All we need to do is legislate to be able to use things that are produced in Nigeria so that we can save our hard earned uh, foreign currency. And then, of course, uh, having seen all of this, we begin to look at what do we need to do? We have done quite well, no doubt, in terms of preparation, in terms of um, the mandates of the NCDC, um, the role of the PTF and the Federal Ministry of Health. In fact, we must not forget the private sector. This perhaps is uh, um, one of the best uh, period between private sector and public of, uh, the public sector, where they work together, uh, private sector providing funding uh, for public sector to work. We got funding from some private bodies uh, to develop some of these things that we have developed. So we are saying that we need to ensure that our regulatory agency uh, fast track regulatory issues. We are not saying they should not do their job, but they should fast track. The solidarity track, which was being done by WHO, couldn't go on in Nigeria because of some of the regulatory issues. I'm also aware that the Lagos State Government planned a randomized local trial, but I'm not sure if they're able to start. Again, regulatory issue was part of uh, the problem. So we must uh, do that. We must uh, also uh, take advantage of Gavi now because they are going to leave us very soon. And once they leave us, even the smaller number of uh, the vaccine doses that we are getting, we may not be able to get it. So we need to pay attention to our local vaccine production. So the major issue here is that government has not directly funded clinical research during disease outbreaks. 
even outside disease outbreak. But for disease outbreak, it's much more important. So a nation really needs to fund research for these purposes that I have mentioned. And then, of course, uh, we should move away from uh, relying on foreign donor. That's what we've been doing. And we should ensure that we have institutionalized research culture in Nigeria. Pay particular attention to research because most of the time is if high income country people that come and dictate what we do. Some of these things may not be beneficial to our own research priorities and agenda. And therefore the conclusions of such research often do not have a direct local benefit to us. We do not have enough researchers. If you look at Nigeria and South Africa in Africa seems to be uh, the, the biggest or the big brothers with uh, the highest number of researchers. But when we look at per million population, how many researchers uh, does Nigeria have per million population in, this, in the lower slide? You see that Nigeria doesn't seem to have even as much required by other smaller African countries. There is a need for us to develop um, next uh, uh, crop of researchers for the country. We are not doing so badly when we also talk about productivity. But again, when you look at how many papers are we publishing, by researchers and per million population, we are not doing too well with it. So again, we are talking about providing a research environment. We need to support future research leaders. We need to create mentors and mentee relationship so that people who are coming behind can learn the art from those who already know. And then we need to be able to um, uh, move closer to the policymakers. Because if we do not carry policymakers along, we will produce a research report that will not be used by anybody. So we are talking about advocacy. Make policymakers to use research findings, improve communication between researchers and policymakers, and then of course, involve policymakers and community when we are planning research. So that when we eventually come up with results, it will be acceptable to both of them so that we will not have implementation issues. So we need to ensure that we bring down to town. Researchers and private sector must come together. That is still uh, far-fetched in Nigeria. And that's why a lot of research reports produced by university and research institutes just gather dust, uh, mainly for promotion. And after you become professor, you don't bother about it. I think we need to do better and engage the public so that they can come up uh, with, to take up uh, uh, by entrepreneur, whatever we have been able to produce. And we must encourage the private sector to participate in determining what kind of research that are required. We may, we may need to create some research foundation for funding as we have done in, in our institute. And there has to be a, a workable and active collaboration between government agencies and then the private sector. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chancellor, our distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I believe that with the review that I have done, Nigeria is indeed going in the right direction as regards infectious disease outbreak preparedness and response. We have seen what the NCDC have done so far and the, the cooperation between the NCDC, the Federal Ministry of Health, and then the federal government through the PTF. However, we believe the NCDC should ensure that simulation in readiness for disease outbreak in future must include researchers so that we can both have a strong and robust team that can uh, face any outbreak in future. Government must prioritize and implement uh, the national action plan to strengthen health security in Nigeria. And um, I think lastly, uh, we need to bring everybody, uh, every hands on deck so that we can work as a team. Uh, the public, uh, National Public Health Institute, uh, the case managers in teaching hospitals, the researchers in universities and, and the research centers must come together to pre-plan and pre-position the type of research that may be required during an outbreak, possibly have a generic protocol like the WHO has done for many trials required, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. This opportunity needs to be honest. 
It has eluded us severally in the past. Now is the time to act. We do have the ingredient, but we need to cook it. We must create deliberate capacity building in clinical trial and vaccine development. We need strong partnership across the globe. NCDC already have that. The universities already have that, but we can still improve on it. I think lastly, government must ensure that they bring back the Nigerian bio vaccine. We have been producing vaccines in Nigeria. There is no reason why we can't start all over again. I'm aware that the Federal Ministry of Health and Federal Government have put about 10 million on this project, and the project is just gradually moving. Hopefully, if um, we pay significant attention to it, within the next one year, we should be able to produce vaccines in Nigeria. I thank you very much for your time. I'm done, Professor Dogo. I'm trying to stop sharing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Salako, for that erudite lecture. It has been an extraordinary one hour, very illuminating, and I'm sure that it's going to attract a lot of questions and contributions from the audience. Uh, I'm very happy that you took time to showcase uh, the experience of Nigeria in managing COVID-19 and where we are today. Uh, before I allow the audience to ask questions, one thing that's on my mind is the fact that you've taken your time at your junior introduction to tell us about the weaknesses in our the inherent weakness in our health sector. I'm going to ask that, uh, do you think if there's another pandemic tomorrow, Nigeria and Nigerians will respond differently? That's the first question I want to ask. And uh, I'm sure that uh, I can see Professor Eredi there and many people there, Professor Idris, and so many people who are online, and I'm sure that they will be ready to ask, they, they want to ask one question or the other. So please, we'll ask for, I will allow the speaker to take the questions in batches. And uh, after every five questions, he will respond and we'll continue to take questions. So now it's time for questions from the public. Any question? Certainly this lecture is very topical and uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of things uh, we want to know from the guest speaker. Yes, Mr. Shaman, sir. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. You're welcome. I'm Yusuf calling from my degree. You're welcome, Yusuf. And I think um, Salakov's presentation is actually well taken. And, um, we really enjoyed it. And um, we also appreciate the efforts of the Nigeria Institute for Medical Research in developing some vaccines and um, also developing some chest feeds. My question actually is um, very simple and straightforward. Um, while talking about SCODA, one of the test kits, he made mention that the kit is highly sensitive and highly specific. So, um, is, is it possible for us to know the percentage of sensitivity and specificity of these test kits? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure the guest speaker has taken note of that. Can we have more questions? Any question? Uh, you may check the chat if, in case there is anyone in the chat. No, I'm sure Professor Eredi want to uh, ask a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Dilidogo, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Salakov, for this uh, great uh, lecture. I must, um, it was uh, filled with um, uh, quite uh, uh, beautiful areas in terms of context and context. Uh, my my um, question, uh, I don't know how to put it now, we have done well. Um, as regards the 
the previous outbreak um, that was brought from uh, Liberia. How, how, how will you say we performed? Even though it was well contained, how did you say we, how, how will you say we performed? Uh, how well did we perform? And then lastly, it's, it's very unfortunate you talked about, uh, yes, uh, our being present or unable to, uh, to produce vaccine. It's, it's, it's very deplorable. Is there any way, is there any way your institute can fast track uh, government so that um, we're able to uh, produce good vaccines against uh, future occurrences of pandemic? Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, sorry, good morning. I, I, I have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Well done, Professor Salako, for, for this very wonderful lecture and Professor Dili Dogo and the Nile University for organizing this lecture. Um, one of the problem we have in Nigeria is issue of attitude. And as you rightly mentioned that you, there is need to connect the gown to the town. And so uh, we can see how, uh, especially religious institutions and uh, some of the people around the town violate um, some of the simple lockdown rules and et cetera. So in as much as we are trying to um, do, produce vaccines, as long as we are not re uh, ready to to actually go by the law, then a lot of problems will continue to, to, to happen. We can see what happened in India, how a lot of deaths are taking place. You've also cited the answers that resulted in, in, in increase in cases. So my hope is that the NCDC and the uh, Nigeria Institute of Medical Research is doing a lot of work to connect uh, with, the, with, with the people in the community with uh, some of the organizations, especially the churches and religious organizations in, in such that uh, we can actually, so that people should understand what is going on and try to sim uh, simply uh, obey some of the rules and the lockdowns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, President Dugo, can I? President Dugo, you are muted. Yes, I think so. You are muted. We can't hear you, Professor Dogo. Maybe you should Sorry, uh, I was saying that uh, before we take the uh, next questions, the person asking the question should please introduce himself or herself. Because the screen is limited so that we take note of those specific questions. But I think for now, we'll allow the guest speaker to respond to uh, the four questions already asked. Then we'll take more after that. Professor Salako. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I thank uh, those who have raised these uh, very important issues um, around the presentation. Now, the first question was um, another pandemic. Are we, are we uh, ready to respond differently? And I would like to say that the response we have had for COVID-19 stemmed out of our experience against uh, Ebola in 2014. And the response we had against Ebola stemmed out of our experience uh, to combat Lassa fever that comes almost on a yearly basis, um, yellow fever, I think much more importantly, uh, poliomyelitis. And we must mention the National Primary Healthcare Development Agencies, which has platform around Nigeria <laughs> where they have grass um, root um, workers who go even into the hard to reach areas to vaccinate people. So we have been doing this over the years. So we are well connected with the people in the community. And so when the disease came and control measures started, it was easy to use this platform to talk to the people in those hard to reach areas about this new disease. It was easy to talk about the MPIs, you know, pharmacological interventions, apart from the ones we hear on the print and electronic media. 
So we had this experience over the past years and they have become very useful to us. And um, when Ebola came, it came first to Lagos. When COVID-19 came, it came first to Lagos. So the experience that Lagos had in being able to come up with emergency isolation centers, you know, organizing a, a kind of a emergency operation center, all of this, and the fact that the SCDC had the incidence uh, communication center, all of them have been on ground. So it was just easy for them to reactivate them. And so when the disease came again, it was like, oh, we've seen, we've gone through this road before. Even though the way and the, the manner that this infected people, it infected more, a lot more people than the Ebola. So we went into community transmission quite early before we knew it. But then the fact that they had structures on ground and they were able to come up with uh, uh, instructions for people. That's why, so I believe that if we have another one, we are going to add the experience of COVID-19 pandemic to that of Ebola, to that of, and then use all of them to tackle uh, the next outbreak. Um, Skoda is 97% um, uh, uh, sensitive and 100% uh, specific. So the specificity is 100%, sensitivity is 97%. Uh, um, Ebola, I think I've tried to answer how well we performed with the yeah. Ebola. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, we are lucky. Hey, we are a praying country. Yes, we are a praying country and God is answering our prayer. But we must also not forget that these platforms that we have and these uh, field epidemiologists that have been trained that are all over the place, the fact that we have these grassroots people that are already vaccinating people, they are familiar with it, they can pass information to them, also helped us. Otherwise, this is the second time coming that we are having a disease outbreak and Nigeria is surviving it. So this is not a matter of chance. This is about what we have been able to do. And I hope that uh, the next concern, which is the issue of attitude, uh, will not take us back to, um, 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 to the third wave. Because the natural way for the disease is to keep coming from one wave and another and another if we are not able to break the cycle until we are able to vaccinate a significant number of people. And I believe by now, with our community infection, we probably have close to 40% of our population that are carrying about the antibodies, um, even though some people lose them. But when they have a second infection, they don't get as sick as before. This may be, that's not at the level of herd immunity though, but I don't have a doubt that it has some effect on why our case is the way it is in country now. Is there a way to produce vaccine against future occurrence? Currently, the federal government is talking to, I hope I can say this, to some eminent Nigerians. And because they are Nigerians and they are trying to make our country better, I will mention it. Um, Mrs. Okonjo Ewiala, uh, Mrs. Aminat Mohammed, I believe, um, the, the ADB president um, and um, uh, this uh, former Minister of Health, former Minister of State for Health, Ali Pate, and about five of them, eminent Nigerians, have been talking to the Federal Ministry of Health on how to ensure that Nigeria starts to produce COVID-19 vaccine in the next few months. I don't know how fast we can uh, run with that, but meetings are happening and the biovaccine people are there and they are also talking to people who are Nigerians or non-Nigerians who have the, the, the platform and template for vaccine production to see how these eminent Nigerians can assist to ensure that we start to produce COVID-19 vaccine in Nigeria. And then we'll use that platform to produce other vaccines so that when COVID-19 is gone, we will be able to use them to attack other future outbreaks. I think I've been able to talk about, thank you. Thank you so much for addressing these questions. I'm sure there are more questions out there. I can see uh, uh, Dr. Titula Obilade had sent in a question. Uh, I don't know if 
uh, is accessible to you. Otherwise, you can uh, ask a question, and any other person who should ask a question it. can ask. You can read the question. Okay. Professor Abilade, are you there? Uh, there's, there's a question about um, um, conviction of government uh, research on research funding and translational research. And uh, let me see the other one. Yes, government can do everything. We agree. Um, how to convince policymakers? I think these two questions are about the same. We know that government cannot do everything. That's why we suggested that universities may create research foundation so that at the, pl at the platform of research foundation, they can leverage on individuals who are high network, who has money to give to support research. And they can also um, engage um, multinational and multilateral companies who can also support research. Once they know that the foundation is not bogged down by government bureaucracy, and they know that there will be transparency, they may be able to put some fund for research uh, in our institution. Now, the other bit is that government needs to realize that if we don't fund research to solve our own peculiar health issues, nobody is going to do it for us. So it's not just enough to say, go and write proposal and get funding. They are funding all over the place. Those fundings that are all over the place are, are uh, 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 targeted at a particular disease or program of importance to the funder, which may not be to us. Look at Lassa fever since 1960 something, no vaccine. Nobody has been able to do anything because it's not a problem to them. So we need to look inward and say, Lassa fever is a problem. This is so, so billion for researchers in Nigeria. We want solutions to this problem in the next five to 10 years. I'm sure that will happen. So we, that area, we must get government to know that that has to be done. But uh, our scientists need to carry along, like I said, the policy makers, the decision makers, when we are planning research. We should not just sit in our offices and uh, bring up theories and hypotheses and put it in paper, and then hope that when we come up with results, somebody in the Ministry of Health will listen to you. You necessarily have to engage them, bring them to your workshop, formulate the ideas together, Give them role to play, maybe to inspect the program, maybe even possible to read reports and make suggestions. We need to do that very, very commonly for us to be able to carry them along. Because if they don't understand what we have done, and we have put these things down in a jargon scientific language, it will not mean anything to them. So we have to bring them on board in early part of the formulation of the ideas. And the community themselves must also know, generally the stakeholders, who will use your result. That's why we are having implementation issue. The most research of implementation research has shown that the, 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 the challenge we have is not about the efficacy or effectiveness of a drug or vaccine, but it's about implementation. People who know about it, why are they not using it? What are their issues? It's because they are not part of it from the beginning, so they don't understand. So this is a one area where we as scientists have to improve. And I did mention the issue of advocacy, that we necessarily have to continue to talk to them, to engage with them at the level of the National Assembly, we are the appropriate fund for some of these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for those answers, I'm sure the answers themselves are generating a lot of uh, questions. Uh, if there are some more questions, we will take them. Otherwise, the lecture itself is being live streamed and it will be there on our Facebook and on the website of uh, Nile University of Nigeria. And I'm sure after that, 
There's even more comments uh, on Facebook, and perhaps uh, Professor Salako will be there to answer some of the questions. But if there are some in the audience now who still want to ask questions, we'll grant that opportunity. Any more questions? Well, yes. Okay. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sorry, uh, I, my connection I was. Um, this is Titi Lola Obiladi. My connections were going in various ways. So, um, thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. What I was trying to get was that even if the research is done, sir, how do we con convince our policy makers to actually react to our findings? Because we've done so much research, but at the same time, apart from the funding. Getting our policymakers convinced that this is the right thing to do, this is the right path to follow. Sometimes they're at odds because our policymakers can't all be medical doctors. So, how do we get into to be able to convince them that this is the right path to follow, especially because there will be a future pandemic and we have to be ready? Thank you, sir. Any more questions, please? Um, hello, I, I want to, it, it's, it's, it's more of a, a suggestion that I want to make for the Nigerian really? Go ahead. Research. Thank you very much again. I'm, I'm Dr. Dala De Adamu. I'm actually an associate professor at Gombe State University. However, I'm a doctoral researcher in primary health care and health system at the University of Edinburgh now. Um, uh, I, I'm happy some of the researches that have, done, have been done what we tend to lack is the presence of Nigeria Institute of Medical Research in, in most of our institutions across the country. As, as Prof. Salako has stated, now there is a lot of um, testing institutions training that has been done across the country with over 100 laboratories that has been established by, by, the, Nigeria, by the Center for Disease Control. I would like to see the presence of Nigeria Institute of Medical Research maybe regionally across six zones, or maybe more than that, whereby the Nigeria Institute of Medical Research carries some of these zones or institutions or universities with, with researches, um, so that maybe there is like a coordinator, Nigeria Institute of Medical Research coordinator, maybe in Meduguri or Gombe, and then Kano Sokoto across the East, uh, Enugu and something like that, so that we have a lot of uh, presence of the Nigeria Institute of Medical Research. And with that, I believe, we, a lot can be done. So thank you very much. Thank you for that contribution. Uh, I'm sure the uh, uh, guest speaker is taking notes on that. Uh, I remember last time I discussed with him, he is trying to expand uh, the reach of uh, Nigerian Institute of America Research to the nook, uh, nooks and corners of Nigeria, and I'm sure he's taking note of that. Uh, would you respond to uh, uh, the comment or the question from Dr. Obilade, please. Okay, th th thank you very much, uh, Professor Dogo. Um, the issue of um, engaging policymaker, I think I mentioned it. But you see, this is um, a bilateral thing. Uh, we as scientists must change our focus. Um, researchers in the university often have one goal to become a professor. They have, um, in most cases, left the part of translational research that will add value to the uh, country's health system and um, research generally. And once they become professor, um, rather than start professing, they stop professing. And because their primary goal is to become professor. I think this has to change um, because when you become professor is when your impact uh, should be felt the more, not just about teaching and training, but also about research and research innovation patents and products which should be coming from, so, and it is not as if we lack ideas. The ideas are there. In fact, some have gone, got patents, made innovations, 
but they don't know how to go about it. And I believe one of the things we must do is that we must learn to disseminate. That is an important part of research, dissemination for research. If you are putting a proposal together and you are looking for funding, you must also put funding for dissemination. And dissemination is not just about publishing because we are, again, because of promotion, because of visibility in the science world, we just think that dissemination is about publishing. Publishing, I impact journal, what about local journal? How would those people locally, your colleagues, know that this is what you are doing? Otherwise, you are going to be speaking only to the converted. And those who should take this report and make use of it will not even know that it does exist. So we must always plan dissemination, bringing the stakeholders together, asking the policy makers or decision makers to come around and telling them about your finding and importance of this um, uh, research finding and how you think it can help the country. This way, we will be able to win some of them. But if all we do is to, to publish, to become professor, and after that, we are not interested any longer, then we are not making any significant contribution to the country. So I, I, I believe that these are the weaknesses on the part of researchers and the universities. And the universities must also come up with um, maybe establish their own local small company, which will be like a, a, a corporate marketing unit that will look at the lecturers, the, the university professors, engage with them productively. What do you have? What have you developed? What are, get all of this together. And then they are the one that will uh, interface uh, with uh, the private sector. If we have this kind of arrangement, then um, the company will help the researcher who has been able to produce a patent to turn it to a product, or who has been able to produce a product to upscale it for an entrepreneur to take it over. I believe the university have that function to perform, to be able to assist the, the scientists in the universities and the institutes to, to get their innovations and, and the research products uh, 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 upscaled to the community. NIMA has um, um, sites, we call them outstation in Meduguri, um, the, the place we are trying to renovate it. And I was talking to Professor Dogo sometimes that if we finish, we might pick a few lecturers from the University of Meduguri to have a joint position with us so that they can begin to work there. Because right now, we do not have enough staff on ground not even research researchers on ground. And therefore we cannot develop the laboratories, nobody to use it. But if we are going to do that, we must have a staff on ground. We have in, in Kanji, Kanji is our malaria field. That's where we do the insecticide testing, um, where we test the long uh, uh, impregnated nets and then the insecticide. We have a field there and we have again, few researchers there. Not enough, we need to uh, increase the number. And then recently, the governor of uh, um, Delta State invited us to help put up a program in the place. The interest was in HIV and TB. They've provided us with a building and we have, um, and then furnish it. And we have provided them some equipment. They gave us some counterpart funding and we are building the place up. We could have launched the place if not because of COVID-19 that came and then disrupted our plan. So, but the place is functioning bit by bit now. Uh, so that, that's the way we are now. If we have the opportunity to employ people and then we can go to the zones of the country. Thank you for the thank you. advice and comment. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, in fact, uh, when uh, uh, Professor uh, Obilade talked about transferring research into policy. It reminded me of uh, uh, the lecture given by late Professor Edachaba uh, uh, when he was making his Nigerian National Merit Award uh, lecture. And uh, the topic of the lecture was actually converting research into policy. And he said in the course of events, out of his researches, he was able to convert 15 into policies. 
And what was the missing link we are having now? The missing link is about advocacy. We are so engulfed in our laboratories, in our clinics, within the university, walls of the university, and we don't reach out. And when you don't reach out to policymakers and make them understand and convince them about the importance of the research findings, you don't expect them to transcribe it into, into policy. So I think academicians must work hard to ensure that any positive research that is impactful on our society must, uh, we must reach out to the politicians, to the administrators, to people in authority and ensure that uh, we bring them on board so that we can transcribe it in uh, a part of our policies. That way will be impactful. And I think the major missing link is advocacy. With that remark, uh, do we have anybody wishing to ask any more questions or we begin to draw the curtain to a close? Well, uh, the silence means that there is no more outstanding question. Let me again seize this opportunity to thank Professor Babatunde Lawal Salako, uh, the Chief Executive Officer and Director General of Nigerian Institute of Medical Research for accepting to present this lecture despite the very short notice. Uh, I'm sure all of us are excited about the quality of the lecture. In fact, the remarks I'm receiving here already tells me that the audience is everywhere. And I'm sure that uh, such public lecture is actually reaching out to uh, a large number of the public. And I'm sure that if we continue that way, we'll continue to educate ourselves, advise ourselves, and move on. Professor Babatunde Shalakwa, I want to thank you so much for that error that lecture. And uh, we are really grateful to you for coming on board. Let me also I uh, thank the Vice Chancellor of Nile University of Nigeria for creating the enabling platform for us to host this. And beyond that, thank the general public, our friends, well wishers out there that have joined us on this special occasion. We want to thank our deans and uh, head of departments too, our students, and anybody that has worked so hard to make this uh, a success. We are grateful to you, and we look forward to having you on our next uh, public lecture series. Once more again, thank you so much and God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That brings this public lecture to Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.